Happy Sunday, Grace family. This is Josh and Marcy Mitchell with our little dude, Ivan, coming to you from our backyard. Thanks so much for tuning into our online service today. We're so glad you're joining us. We love to interact with you throughout the service, so make sure that you jump into the chat. In the description below this video, you'll find some links for a few different ways to connect with us. Yeah, you can follow along with Pastor Steve's sermon. You can fill out a digital connection card to get more information about our church and get connected. And you can also give to allow everything that our church does because of your generosity. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's worship God together this morning. My sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began was redeemed only beauty remains my open heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested Yeah. 
Well, hey, hello, Grace Community Fellowship. So glad to be with you today. Uh, so thankful to be able to come on. And uh, Pastor Steve gets a week off, and I get a chance to help us walk through First John together. Hey, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Troy Dean. I'm the campus pastor and a professor of Christian ministry at Northwest Christian... Oh, wait a second. Oh, wow. We're about a month away from changing our name. We are becoming Bushnell University. I know some of you probably already know that, uh, but I just want to tell you this. I am so excited for our name change. So we're excited to continue to extend and reach and uh, build beyond the Pacific Northwest by extending the, the work that we get to do to help students unpack their calling and uh, really live a life of service. So our Christ-centered focus does not change. It's just a name change. Uh, and hey, I want to give a shout out to all those graduating seniors, whether high schoolers or college. Um, in our home right now, we have one that just graduated actually from NCU, uh, becoming Bush now. And uh, he graduated with a double major, uh, communication and English. And so I want to give a shout out to Tanner. And then also in the back of the room here in my office today uh, is Matt. And uh, Matt is also a recent graduate. And so congratulations, Matt. Way to go, man. Uh, so in our house, our house is kind of full right now. It's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, it's a good kind of full. Uh, three college students, the one that has graduated and the two others are now back in our house. Uh, and uh, the other two students brought all of their furniture back from campus. So we redecorated. Uh, it's a new style. and You're not probably familiar with it, but I'm calling it uh, post-dormitory as a style in our house. Uh, and the primary factor of how it's a post-dormitory style uh, is the ratio of futons to people in our house. We probably have more futons than people. Uh, and then, of course, uh, my amazing Wonder Woman wife, Dawn, who is a fifth grade teacher, uh, is navigating that world with parents. And I know so many of you are trying to be parents and teachers and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so she's working really hard to help support her students and those parents who are helping to uh, educate their students along this way during this quarantine. And uh, our house has kind of been redesigned in another way, too. Uh, in some ways, it kind of has a Zoom feel to it. Uh, if you're familiar with the new uh, online protocols that everybody's using to do meetings, uh, Zoom is one of the primary ones, whether it's Teams or Facebook Live or whatever else you're using. Uh, but Zoom is a lot, and I'm in a lot of Zoom meetings. Uh, and uh, if any of you have a cure for Zoom butt, just DM me. I need to figure out how to fix this. Uh, but hey, let's jump into the passage of Scripture today. Um, I'm calling this message today, Signs of Life and Love. And you'll get a sense to see right away kind of why that is so. Uh, and this passage is a challenging passage. And you've probably heard that from Steve over the last few weeks. Uh, but 1 John is a challenging book. Um, and, and what happens in Scripture is you kind of have three different kind of postures that Scripture can take. Um, I like to say it this way, that sometimes Scripture is encouraging. It's like a pat on the back, like, hey, good job. Other times, uh, scripture is more exhort exhortation, like it's exhorting you to do something. So it's more of like a kick in the butt. It's kind of like, hey, get going, you know better. But sometimes scripture is more prophetic, and that's more like a slap in the face. Or if you prefer, like I do, maybe like a wiffle ball, wiffle ball bat against the head, go gunk, you know, one of those big, thick wiffle ball bats. And what it's basically saying is it's trying to get your attention. Something is probably not right. We need to do some assessment. We need to see the signs of what is unhealthy. And we need to get back on track with God. And that's what this passage is going to be about today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to look at passage basically 7 through 11, those verses. But then also look back at some of the things that Steve said last week. This passage is definitely on the exhortation level. And it has some pieces of prophecy. What does that mean? Well, if you've heard me teach before, you know I like for people to call and respond back to me. So, Matt, you're welcome to do that today. Uh, and I usually have people say words like amen or ouch. Amen means we agree, and that's a really good point. Ouch usually says, wow, I need some attention to do that in my own life. This passage has more ouches than amens. Uh, regardless of how we uh, feel about some of these things and where you're at today, I hope that you genuinely get a chance to hear from God. I hope that the Holy Spirit speaks through these scriptures and these things that we're bringing attention to and that can really shape our hearts and our lives during this time. Uh, so I've been having a lot of conversations with people about signs. I've actually had some people come up to me and say, Troy, is this like one of the signs of the apocalypse? Is this, is this like the world ending? This global pandemic? Um, people really struggling kind of personally with things? The, the amazing... like." Um, just challenges that we have before us. Also, 
a fair amount of really anger and angst around the globe. Uh, folks are probably more divided than ever before, um, and there's lots of challenges. So what about those signs? I think we've also been looking at different kinds of signs for like COVID-19. I mean, how many of us were looking and so acutely looking at things like symptoms? Like, was that a cough? What kind of cough was that? Is that in your chest? Are you, are you okay? Have you been having that? Is it just the flu or is it this kind of virus flu? Uh, we're always looking for those kind of things. So other signs of the pandemic? Uh, lack of things on shelves. I mean, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, and now maybe even meat products for a while. I mean, all these things are signs that something is going on and we have to give attention to it. One of my favorite comedians is a comedian named Bill Engvall. And he actually does a, a bit in his comedy routine about signs. And his thing is more about like when people ask silly questions or maybe the answer is pretty obvious. And then he kind of wants to give them a sign that says like, duh, or like, were you not thinking about that before you asked it? And so he gives a couple of examples. Like one example is, you know, uh, he showed up to a ski resort or he got off of a plane, got into a, a rental car, put his skis on the roof rack of the car. And before he could drive away from the airport, someone said, hey, you got to go skiing? And of course, his, his, the whole point of this routine is just to give a silly answer to that. He says, no, we're not skiing. But if the car flips over and we're on ice, we're good to go. Another example he uses about a guy, a truck driver, driving down the street and his truck gets stuck underneath an overpass. And he's like, oh man, this is embarrassing. And he gets out and uh, Bill Engvall says he's actually there in the moment. And a, uh, a you know, highway patrol man shows up and he's going to ask the guy the question. And he thinks, oh my gosh, don't ask the question. Don't ask the question. And sure enough, he does. The highway patrolman says, got your truck stuck? And the, highway, the, the truck driver, without skipping a beat, says, no, I was delivering this here uh, overpass and I ran out of gas. Here's your sign. So this passage in 1 John has all different kinds of signs. Matter of fact, there's three primary signs that he's pointing us to. What he's asking for us is to think about our own life and are the signs of devotion to God, are the signs of our growing maturity in Him, and is our love abounding for other people? These are signs, he's saying, of somebody who is genuinely following God. Now, I don't know where all you are at right now in your own journey with God. Some of you are probably on fire and excited, probably missing the time we get to gather together and together in a church and sing out loud and worship together and be in scripture together. Some of you are probably struggling, figuring out like, where is God in the midst of all this? And then for many of you, I mean, maybe you're turning in on the internet and you just happen to find this church and you're asking questions. Where is God right now? Is there an actual God? This passage is going to give us signs of what it looks like to grow in maturity of following God. And wherever you're at, we all can keep growing. We can take a next step. And I hope that this passage not only challenges us, but also gives us some practical things to do. So here are John, the author of this book, 1 John, three signs of love and life. The first one comes out of that first passage uh, in John chapter 2 verses 3 through 5, the first part of that verse. And again, this is what Pastor Steve kind of led us through last week. He says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And so what we find in this passage is that he's saying that to know God means to keep his commands. So a very simple equation. If you know God, you keep the commands. Now, some people want to say the word obey, and the word obey is definitely in that passage, but it's got a more robust meaning to it. What it means is, is you're guarding them, you value them, and you're implementing them in your life. So it's not just a, a rote obedience to something. When God says, hey, don't kill people, it's not like, okay, I can't kill people because God says so. No, he's saying... Don't kill people because I value people. They're made in the image of God. That that's harmful. We want to see people flourish. We want to see them grow. And we want them to know God. And so don't kill them is not just an a, a, a command to obey, but it's a command to keep, to honor, to value, to see why God is teaching us this. So he says, if you know God, you keep his commands. If you don't, you lie. And he's saying that it's, it's not consistent and not congruent with that right? And how do I know you lie? Because your lips are moving and you lie, 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 lie. Sorry, today's message will be filled with lots of different references to songs, especially love songs, by the way. So the first sign, again, is knowing God, you keep his commands. So 
if he says, if you don't keep the commands that you lie and the truth is not in you. Now, hold on to that idea of truth because we're going to come back to that in just a minute. The second sign is this, and it comes out of that 1 John chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. He says, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So the second part of this is if you live in God, another good word for that is abide. If you abide in God, you live in him, you stay connected to him, you are remaining in him. And it's more of that experiential relationship, not just this idea that I agree to some tenets of faith, but I'm actually connected to him. And if I abide in him, then you'll walk in the ways of Jesus. That's probably our first ouch. Because that means that we're supposed to look at the way Jesus lived and pattern our lives after him. I don't get to have the option to do things my own way. I actually have to see how Jesus would handle something and then line my life, my heart, my values, and my practices to Jesus. And so um, this idea of abiding connects us to this, how theologians use this word, um, this concept that we abide in God because of his, L, uh, his DBR. DBR simply means this, his death, burial, and resurrection. And we talk about this because this idea that we live a new life, that we live in him, is because Jesus is still alive. Like he was crucified on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and then came back to life. The DBR, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But John adds another letter. He actually says, that's not enough, theologians. You need to add, add another letter. And he would say it's the L-D-B-R. It's the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So often we get focused on the forgiveness that we get through Jesus because of what he accomplished on the cross. And we miss the fact that he lived a life for us to pattern our lives after. He actually gives us an example. He actually says to us, here's the deal. I'm going to take a shot at this first. He comes in human form. He lives out this beautiful life and says, thou, this is what you're supposed to do. So if we claim to abide or live in God, then we have to walk like Jesus walked. Well, the third sign that we get to look at is really the one that we get to look at for the, re the rest of our message. And it comes out of this passage again, starting in verse 7. 1 John 2, 7 through 8. Dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. So what he adds to the idea of knowing and keeping, abiding and living or walking, he now says, if you claim to be in the light, now you have to love other people. Now, he didn't say that immediately in that passage, but we're going to find out why he's referring to that. But here's the deal. I love the way he begins this particular section because he uses the word beloved or depends on your translation of scripture. Um, he says, dear children or dear friends. But the word there is this really, really cool word in Greek. It's agape toi. Agape toi. Agape toi is, the first part is the word agape, which means unconditional love. And toy is this more affectionate, like God is living in you. You are his beloved. I hope that you hear in all of this message today, no matter what um, he's challenging us to do to love other people, that you know more than anything else, you are deeply and profoundly loved by God. You are his beloved. You get to receive love from God and that love can shape, form, strengthen, and empower you to live a life of love. But you are beloved. God loves you. Now, he also says in this that, that this is already available to us because it is in him. I love the way he says this. He says, this truth is seen in him and in you. So let's, uh, let's play with this idea of truth. Man, we live in a world today that has so much misinformation. We, we, we are challenged by this idea of fake news and all these things. Here's what I want you to know. Christian scripture says this. Truth is not an idea. It's not a, a concept. It's not something to be debated or disagree on. Truth is actually a person. That person is Jesus Christ. So no matter what you think about truth, you have to then immediately compare it to who Jesus is. So truth is not some concept, some like 
far off idea. It's actually a person. So our truth that we live as followers of Jesus is to follow Jesus. Now, part of this it combats an early Christian heresy, and that heresy was called Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, basically what it taught was, is we don't need these physical bodies, because ultimately they're going to die, be buried in the ground. What you really need is your mind and your, your concepts of God to be focused on Him. So the body doesn't matter, it's just your mind in which you believe and think about. Now, the challenge with this, of course, is that Jesus put on a body. So immediately we have a challenge to this, this heresy. Jesus embodied love. It wasn't the fact that his physical body didn't matter. Matter of fact, it showed us the most best way to understand what it looks like to follow him. So now we have this idea that Jesus is not just telling us great ideas. He's showing us a way to actually live. The truth lives and it has a certain way. Matter of fact, John in his gospel says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's just reemphasizing this in his letter. So Jesus is a brilliant teacher. Now, I, that hopefully you all agree with that. Maybe some people said some amens in the process. But here's the problem. The problem is we all will agree. As a matter of fact, most people on the planet, when we talk about Jesus, will say, he was a great teacher. But here's the challenge. Why do so many of us think that the things he's taught us to do and showed us to do are optional? Jesus never gives any option for this. He doesn't say, oh, hey, here's some ideas. Now apply them if you would like to. He's a brilliant teacher. He's, he's teaching us truth from God, and now we have to apply it. So here's your big idea. If you've been waiting to see what the big idea for this message today is, here's the big idea. When Jesus is in you, love comes out of you, and the world lights up. So we're, that's where we're going, right? This is what he's talking about this passage. When Jesus is in you, love comes out of you, and the world lights up. So you might ask the question, what's love got to do with it? There's a great theologian, musical theologian, and she's saying, what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do, got to do with it? What's love but a second-hand emotion? What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? Ah, Tina, don't be so discouraged. I know love is hard in this world, and we get heartbroken so many times. But he's going to teach us about love in this passage. So let's continue on. Jesus says, uh, John says about Jesus in this, that he taught us a new commandment. But it's old, but it's new. Thanks, John. That's really helpful. <laughs> what does he mean by this? Well, he says that it's new because at that time, the followers who have gotten this letter from him, it's called an epistle, 1 John, they would have also had available to them the gospel of John. In other words, what he wrote about the eyewitness that he had with Jesus because John walked around with Jesus and saw this. So they would have already had this and they would already have ringing in the back of their ears words from Jesus like these out of John 13. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So in their mind, they already know that Jesus has already said a new command. This is the new command that you're supposed to love one another. But he also says it's old. Well, how is it old? Well, immediately again, they would re be reminded of how when Jesus sums up the 600 plus commands and laws in the Old Testament, at that time, it's just the, the law, that he sums it up in a very simple way. And matter of fact, he refers to a passage in Leviticus and brings it forward and says, of all these 600 plus laws, here are the two that are most important. The first one we know is he teaches it. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, the second one is like it. And this is where it comes out of. It comes out of Leviticus 19, 18. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So he immediately says that there's two commands. You're supposed to love God and love others. And that's old. That's not new. But then he says again, it's new. So how do we know it's new again? Well, Jesus, again, sums it up, right? When he does come and he says, here's a new command I give to you. And here's what the part is so amazing. In the original command to love our neighbors as ourselves, we only knew and understood at that time the way that we could love our neighbors. And it had to be focused on, and Jesus used an the, the Old Testament used an illustration, as ourselves. Why? Because we only know of a selfish love. We only know how to take care of ourselves. We don't have great examples in this world of what love is. But when Jesus comes, he models for us a selfless love. And now when he says, love one another, he says, as I have loved you. 
He just upgraded the greatest commandment. He not only took it from love your neighbor as yourself, he upgrades it and says, no, now you have to love them selflessly. And that's the kind of love that he's talking about in this passage. So what is love? Um, I know some of you may have another uh, song popping into your head. I refer, I, I'm going to reject Hathaway right now. No, I'm not going to do Not going to go there. Uh, but here's what love is. Well, first of all, let me tell you what love is not. It's not a secondhand emotion. <laughs> Sorry, Tina. Uh, it's not something we could throw away. Uh, but we also oftentimes still refer to it as an emotion. And I want to, I want to, I want to do some, some arguing with that. Uh, an emotion is something that can move and shift on any given day. I mean, I can wake up on the wrong side of my bed and be upset or discouraged with something in my life, and I can choose to not love. Or I can feel like somebody's hurt me, and I can wall off my heart to them and choose not to love. So it's not just an emotion. It's also not a magical force. I mean, we use phrases all the time in our romantic world about the idea that, oh, I fell in love with this person or I've fallen out of love. And it's not some magical force. You're actually in control of the love in your life. Matter of fact, that's how God has made you. God has made you someone who has the capacity to love. That capacity is not some magical force outside of you. If you follow Jesus, it's actually inside of you. You now have a capacity to love that is beyond just the selfish love that we have. It's a love that's given to us by God through his Holy Spirit to now selflessly love other people. So it's not a secondhand emotion. It's not some magical force. I think it's a practice of conviction. Love is a practice of conviction. It's a practice because I have to get better at it. I'm actually not good at it. I mean, I might've been good at it initially in my life. You know, I see the devotion of my mom when I was a, a kid, but at the end of the day, I actually get worse at it as life goes on. And so I have to grow in love. So it's a practice. I have to keep trying it on. But it's also a practice of conviction. In other words, my conviction tells me that love is possible, that love is powerful, and that love comes from a source in Jesus Christ. And because I have that conviction, I can practice love. I don't just immediately write it off. I don't, I don't justify why I choose not to love certain people, or I don't wall off my heart to other people who have hurt me. Because... That is not the focus. The focus is the fact that God has it inside of me. So it's a practice of conviction. I did a wedding for a couple of number of years ago, and it was really sweet uh, because the bride had her grandparents be a part of their ceremony. The, her grandparents had been married for 50 years, and the grandparents wanted to renew their vows in the middle of the service as her and her groom, her soon-to-be husband, were doing their initial vows. It was beautiful. I got a chance to be there and a part of the practice of this, this older couple who'd been married for 50 years, they wanted their rings to be blessed. And so I got a chance to bless their rings as they, again, put them on their fingers to remind themselves of the covenant that they had made before God to love each other. I love that picture of commitment. That is love it is a practice based on a conviction. And then, uh, man, I just saw on the news the other day, this nurse from Ohio who left her family, her three daughters and her husband, and went to New York to serve those who were in harm's way. For those who were struggling and battling the coronavirus, those who are first responders, those in the ER rooms and all those different things, she left her family to go do that. What a selfless act. But what was so beautiful was the reunion. When she came back 42 late, days later and were reunited with her family, she just modeled to her children what love looks like. And that's a powerful moment. All right, let's continue in this passage. Uh, I want to read uh, 1 John 2, verses 7 through 8, which I've already read, but the New Living Translation, because I think there's a really cool little angle that it takes. It says this, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new commandment. Rather, it's an old one you have heard from the very beginning. This old commandment, and then he says, to love one another, is the same message you have heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. So what does it mean to love? It means to put the practice in our life, and that practice is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to take sacrifice, being unconditional. Um, and again, it has to be perceived and received as love. If you say you love someone, and they feel like they, didn't, they were not loved, then you're going to have to actually assess whether or not your love was actually, that was actually a loving act. 
Now, again, I understand what tough love is, but I think we all understand when we know when we've been loved, even if it's been loved in a tough way. So he goes on to this passage, 1 John 2, verses 9 through 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. All right, if you've been waiting to say ouch, this is the ouch moment. It's a challenging passage, isn't it? I mean, he's basically saying here, if you choose not to love other people completely, brothers and sisters, and I don't think brother and sister means just those who agree with you. Ouch. This is brothers and sisters that we are a part of a community, a worldwide community, a universe in which God has brought into this world his children. Now, some of us are wayward and we're not following him, but nonetheless, we've all been marked by the image of God. And so we're supposed to love everyone. It's not, you don't get to decide who you get to love. God has already done it. For God so loved the world, all of people, that he gave his only son. So God has loved everyone. So if God loves everyone, We are called to also do the same. But here's what he says. If you don't love your brother or sister and instead you hate them, then you live in darkness. And darkness is overtaking your idea and your understanding. You're stumbling and at the end of the day, you're blinded. So let's fight back the darkness in our last few minutes. Let's spend some time looking at some practices that will help us fight back that darkness, not only in our lives, but also in the world. what, What does it look like for us to actually love other people? So, here are some signs of love and life that are practices. The first one is this, avoid obstacles to love. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now this passage often shows up in weddings um, and a pastor friend of mine was officiating a wedding and he was starting to go through the vows of, uh, of commitment with the, with the couple. And it was a newer couple in his church and so he was doing the wedding and it, they were kind of just starting their relationship with God. And when he went to the part when he said for richer or for poor or in sickness and in health, it was very interesting the response he got from the bride. When he said for richer or for poor, her response was for richer. And he kind of stopped for a second. Then he went, in sickness and in health. And she said, in health. Whoa, all of a sudden there was a timeout called. Uh, My pastor friend pulled the couple aside and said, hey, so here's the deal. (laughs) A commitment before God includes, these are not options. You don't get to choose from the list. This is an all in or not in thing. God is all in with us. And so we are all in to love other people. And that is not based on circumstances. But this passage also says a couple other obstacles. It says it's not proud. If our pride comes forward, we're not going to be loving. If we dishonor others, it's not loving. If we're being self-seeking, it's not loving. If you're easily angered, it's not loving. And especially here, this one, if you're constantly keeping records of wrongs, it's not loving. Forgiveness has to be part of our equation. Second practice is love with words. Now, Be ready, because this is a willful bat moment. In Matthew 5, Jesus says for us to love other people, and we need to love people consistently and completely. He says, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which at that time was a word of derision, is answerable to the court, and everyone says, your fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. What does he say? Our words have eternal consequences to them. And oftentimes we say things and we speak ill of other people and we justify it. We rationalize it. We say, well, they were being mean or they deserve it or they need to hear the truth from me. And this passage is telling us, nah, you don't get the option. Jesus says that we're supposed to love other people with our words. You're not allowed to use those kinds of words toward another human being made in the image of God. You never have the option of being mean, cutting someone down, using coarse humor, slander, being bullying or mean. Jesus never gives us that option. His only critique of using strong language was to those who claimed by their religious beliefs to be authentic followers of God. And he says, no, just like John says in this passage, 
If you use words that hurt, if you hate other people, then you are not in the light. And he was challenging them to get back into the light, to follow God. So, back to this practice. What does it look like for us to stop using hateful words? To not use words that tear people down. And by the way, when I use words, I mean what you're typing in social media. What are you typing? What are you saying? Are you being hateful? I mean, are you going to type things that crush people or lift them up? Are you going to type things that repel people or draw them to Jesus? Are you going to type things that divide people or unify them? Are you going to type something to create an argument or to build an agreement? Love people where they're at and help them to follow Jesus. Come on, Grace Community Fellowship. Isn't that our vision? Isn't that our mission? That's what we're called to do. So I want to use one little quote here from Dallas Willard because I know that we're moving into, an, this is an election year. And man, talk about challenging. This is only going to get harder, people. So we got to do this well. And here's what Dallas Willard says about the need for people to follow Jesus. In other words, white, know and keep, abide, right, and follow and walk in the ways of Jesus, and now be in light and love other people. He says this, the world can no longer be left to mere diplomats, politicians, and business leaders. They have done the best they could, no doubt. But this is an age for spiritual heroes, a time for men and women to be heroic in their faith and in spiritual character and in power. Come on, you got to say amen to that one in your room. Last sign we'll end here today. Love requires faith and sacrifice. And this is the challenge, right? We have this amazing picture of what love looks like in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, in Philippians, there's this amazing passage about what it looks like, the, how he loved us. Listen to these words. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, rather, he made himself nothing by taking up the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on the cross. Easy translation for today. Jesus gave up his rights so that others might follow God. All right, so this can be very overwhelming. Man, how do we love other people the way Jesus loved other people? Well, uh, we actually have some very practical help. I'm turning to one of the greatest theologians and writers of our time named C.S. Lewis. And, and I'm going to give you probably the best life hack you have ever had in your entire life about loving other people. You ready? So this is the life hack for you to apply this week. Here's what he says. Do not waste time bothering um, whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Let me say that again. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor, but act as as if you did. When you're behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love them. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking them more. If you do them a good turn, you will find yourself disliking them less. There is indeed one exception. If you do this person a good turn, not to please God and obey the law of charity, but to show him what a fine, forgiving chap you are, and put him in your debt, and then sit down and wait for his gratitude, you'll probably be disappointed. How practical is this? So, in some ways, what he's saying is, fake it till you make it. I mean, I don't mean that in some crass or simple, simplistic way, but what he's saying is, if you don't have the capacity to love other people yet, which many of us struggle with that, and we fall short, he says, practice loving them anyhow. What does that mean? It means we have to love people by faith and sacrificially. That we actually have to put ourselves in a place where we choose to love someone regardless if we feel it or not. Because Jesus models for us this amazing sense of love. So today, I hope you've taken some time to check your vital signs for love. Check and assess where you're at in your relationship with God. And Jesus uses this one sign of loving other people as a primary sign. It's almost like our pulse, right? We go to the doctor, he immediately checks our pulse to see how our heart's doing. Jesus is saying this, 
you can immediately check how you're doing with God with whether or not you're loving other people well. So, in conclusion, I want you to take just a quick second. Deep, holy breath. Just be present in this moment. Put away your phones. I see some of you. And just be present in this moment and ask a couple key questions to God. If you would, if you just close your eyes and bow with me, I'll use this as kind of a lead prayer to end our, our message today. Take a minute. Where are you at in this? Ask this question. How is your daily connection to God? Really? How connected to Him are you? Are you putting into practice in your lives, like surrendering to God in the morning, surrender to the Father, then asking to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, directed by His power, and reflect on those around you? How would Jesus love them? Next question. When faced with a challenging person to love, ask this question. What is the most loving and Jesus-like thing I can do? And then do that. Maybe a person's coming to your mind right now. Who is it that you need to genuinely learn how to love like Jesus did, like Jesus would? Lastly, this is probably the most difficult one. If people were walking with you throughout the week, would your, all your actions been seen as loving? And just do a really quick like, reflection on your week. In what ways were you not loving this week? In what ways do you need to realign your life and get more deeply connected to God and access His power to love other people? Can you open your eyes for a quick second? Here's the deal. Our world needs this message more than ever before. We're in a time of division, of struggle, people feeling isolated, people are, 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 are fearful of the future, and people of God. Let me just be very honest with you. The world needs us to be loving. The world needs us to shine like Jesus shines in his love for other people. So, as we end this message, let me close this in prayer and send you out. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this passage of scripture written by your Apostle John, that challenges us to live in the light and love other people as Jesus has loved us. Father, may we be empowered by you today to do that and convicted by your Spirit to find those who are hard to love and extend your love, grace, and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go love someone today, specifically. Bye-bye, everyone. In my mother's womb You formed me with your hands Known and loved by you Before I took a breath When I doubted, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made You're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay Just be
joining us for church this morning. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our content. In the description below, you'll see some discussion questions to further thinking about the message this morning and how it applies to your life. You can also see more content on our website, gcfweb.org. Enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day weekend. Bye. Bye. It's weird with you. Maybe we should angle the couch so that it's... Okay, what are we saying? It... What are we supposed to say? I... Oh, that's supposed to say after that. I forget. <laughs> I don't know. Good... Sorry, you think I would do this for a living? In the car... <laughs> <laughs> He's already over it. Perfect. Good? Yeah.